to a lower court for a fresh look, saying that court did examine. My name is April Hennig, and I'm here today with the Sacred Job Channel. We're here today with Ben Parsons of Infinite Monkey Theorem. And we're actually in Denver, Colorado, of all places. It's kind of a new place, for me at least. And uh, he's actually started this winery back in 2008, and I'm going to let him kind of tell us a little bit about his story and how he got started. Ben? Yeah, so, um, so the name of the winery, the Infinite Monkey Theorem, is a, it's an old mathematical theory that states if you set a monkey at a typewriter and it had an infinite amount of time, it would type the entire world as a Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, basically tests your understanding of infinity and the fact that given an infinite amount of time, anything and everything is possible. So your monkey is your random letter generator sitting at a keyboard of 26 letters in the alphabet. There's only a certain number of permutations and combinations of letters that can even make words. And so given an infinite amount of time, that monkey basically has to type everything that's ever been written and everything that's ever been written an infinite number of times. And in my mind, it's all about creating order out of chaos, right? Mm -hmm. And you think about any agricultural pursuit, it's inherently chaotic. Because right. it's subject to the vagaries of the weather. And no more so than in Colorado with a 200-day growing season. Compared that's to Napa, that's 240 days, you know? Yeah. Like, and then late spring frosts, harsh winters, hailstorms, driving the fruit over the Rocky Mountains, like in an old Dodge truck in a trailer. Mm -hmm. and it could be the middle of November and there's a foot of snow in Bell Pass and the trailer's jackknife in the other way. And then making wine in downtown Denver, you know, in a, basically in an old warehouse and with a back alley with diehard fans pushing their shopping carts by. It's a, chaotic, <laughs> it's a chaotic system. Yeah, it would be. But somehow you end up with a work of art at the bottom, you know, and you think about all of the number of variables that exist in um, sorry, in, uh, in winemaking, mm -hmm. in terms of you know, yeast, sparrow choices. I mean, there's so many variables there are. in viticulture and in mm -hmm. And so it's all about the job of the winemaker to create order out of this otherwise chaotic system. So the name, I think, worked really well for another winery, particularly in Colorado. Right. Um, but yeah, my background, I, uh, I used to sell wine in London. Mm -hmm. And you're from Kent, right? Yeah, from the southeast. So I used to, you know, which is where they make, they make a lot of beer, you know, mm -hmm. so all the hops are grown in, in England. And uh, so basically, um, yeah, I used to work for a wine merchant called Leighton's Wine Merchants. And that was um, uh, selling Bordeaux's, Burgundy's, mm -hmm. like a thousand pound bottles of Petrus to stupid people who wanted to spend a thousand pounds on a bottle of wine. You know? Right. And then anyway, that really got me into it. And then I did a lot of um, traveling. I saw that wineries were always in beautiful parts of the world and I figured mm -hmm. it would be a good way to kind of travel around the world, you know, do a holiday here for three months, travel for three months, go down to the southern hemisphere, you know, mm -hmm. just keep that kind of moving. Anyway, uh, so I actually, I could never have afforded to go to school on my own or, you know, graduate school to do enology, so I got a scholarship from the Grocery Foundation and they paid pay for my entire tuition to go to Australia That's right. to do a graduate degree. So I moved to Australia, made wine, uh, well, studied there, made wine there in um, uh, Rutherglen, like north of Victoria, in northern Victoria, right. outside of Melbourne. Um, prior to that, though, I worked in New Zealand, um, making wine in Marlborough for driving the Sea Lakes Estate, just okay. um, Sauvignon Blanc, to Pinot Wines. And then in 2001, I saw a job advertised for a winemaker in Palisade, Colorado. Didn't even know there were wineries in Colorado. <laughs> anyway, I applied for the job, and... Uh, Literally three days later, they offered me the job via email. Uh, didn't even interview me. Oh wow! Like flew me out. So I was back in London. Uh -huh. They flew me out, and I moved uh, from London to Grand Junction, which is just, for those of you who don't know Grand Junction, it's it's not like London. Right. No. <laughs> it's like a Western yeah, town, very conservative, um, and that was a massive culture shock. Right. So I moved from London to Grand Junction, started making wine for one. Canyonwood Cellars and Palisade. Mm -hmm. And then um, was there for five years, or five harvests at least, started um, consulting for a lot of other wineries at the same time, mm -hmm. ended up moving down to one of the Sucker Vineyards that I've been consulting for since 2003. Made their wine until 2008. Um, and then in 2008, unfortunately, um, my dad died of colon cancer, and that was like a big kind of change in my life. And I decided that I wanted to do my own thing. Right, business plan to start another winery in downtown Denver, mm -hmm. you know, right in the middle of where the economy was tanking and found investors. So yeah, area. found investors to start a winery That's in great. Denver, which probably wasn't that like, high on their Priorities. priority of investments, yeah. you know. And uh, basically bought an old truck and a trailer and drove 25,000 miles in two months. And every piece of equipment you saw in there, even mm -hmm. the tanks, I strapped to the back of that trailer and wow. drove back to a different location over on the other side of town mm -hmm. and started a winery for 
like two hundred eighty thousand dollars. And then first year we did eighteen hundred cases, um, and now in year well last harvest was harvest five mm -hmm. we did uh, fourteen thousand cases. So um, yeah, it's been pretty amazing to see the growth. And, um, the Denver community is really got behind. So it's in like two hundred eighty restaurants in town. Carrying That's awesome. And so are you self distributed? You know, we started self distributing um, for the first three years, and I did all the sales as well, mm -hmm. all the deliveries, and, and then we went through. Uh, a couple of distributors before we found the right one. Um, we ended up with a, with a good one. It's, it's a subsidiary of RNDC, so it's, it's Grand Bin, which is their fine wine division. So, yeah, so no, it's, it's great, yeah. And then we just moved to this location, uh, which is like a 30,000 square foot um, footprint mm -hmm. um, uh, last June from a 7,000 square foot footprint. So, yeah, it's been great to see the growth. So you, now you make everything from bottles and to yeah. cans, yeah. to even growlers. Yeah, we do, we do these cans as well. We do four different, four different flavors in cans. So tell me a little bit about the varietals that you use for each of these. Yeah, so, um, so for bottled product we do, um, we do about eight different varieties. Well, it depends on the year, because one year in Colorado a vineyard will have fruit, mm -hmm. and the next year it won't, you know, and, and just and it could be like half a mile from the other vineyard. It was just, you know, it had a it had a dip or something in there, mm -hmm. and the, the cold air just gathered, obviously. Right. And you had some uh, bud damage. So we do a typical year. We do a Sauvignon Blanc. We blend mm -hmm. it with Sauvignon, so Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon blend. We do a Viognier Roussel blend. Um, last year I did 100% Sauvignon and barrel aged. It was, which was awesome. Just got an 88 in Spectator, which is cool. That's great. Um, then uh, other whites, some years we do a Riesling, some years we don't do a Riesling. On the red side, we always do a Cab Cabernet Franc, a Syrah, a Malbec. Um, we always get some Petit Boudot, whether, it, whether it's made into a 100% variety of Petit mm -hmm. Boudot is, uh, is another question. Um, Petit Syrah, we always get some, depending on the year, but that doesn't overwinter that well in Colorado. Uh, and then we always do a couple of blends, one for the blind watchmaker, which is, could be a blend of anything, and then we do if the year is good enough, we didn't do one in 2011, but 2012 we do a blend called the 100th Monkey, which is mm -hmm. this wine, which has got an 89 in Wine Spectator, which is a high score from Colorado wine. That's great. That's a blend of 29% each of Petit Boudot, Petit Sarah, Malbec, and 13% Cab Franc. And this is your top of the line wine? Right? Yeah, that would retail for about $44. That's great. Like the Syrah would retail for around $30, uh, the Malbec about $25, the cans. Different, different story with the can, 8.4 ounces or 250 milliliters, 100% um, recyclable, aluminum can is infinitely recyclable, um, you know, you throw a can in the recycling bin, it mm -hmm. could be a can in 60 days, right. compared to a glass bottle that's only 17% recyclable. Um, so yeah, the beauty of these, single use, uh, pack in, pack out, if you're hiking, you're camping, you're skiing, you're climbing, and, and of course Colorado is probably the most active state other than maybe, well, it is the most active state. I mean, Oregon's probably high up there. But, um, yeah, so, you know, if you're kind of out in the outdoors, if you're camping, or if you're going to, like, a music venue, like Red Rocks, you know, we have here, you know, um, football stadiums, baseball stadiums, you can't have glass, so they didn't can make a lot of sense. Um, all of the, uh, all of the bottled product, that's all fruit from Colorado, but the, the cans, that's all fruit from California. Um, so, my Moscato is fruit from Clarksburg. Uh, my Rosé is actually Rosé from Napa, Gainey Vineyards. Uh, the, what else do I do? The, um, I do a white, that's an Albarino. Mm -hmm. That's all fruit from Bocas Ranch and Lodi. And then actually the Syrah that I do is 100% Colorado. So three of, one of the four cans is Colorado fruit. And okay. uh, they're all carbonated, so lightly sparkling. Um, and they've been well received. You know, we have koozies for them, people go out there <laughs> and, and it's, it's a lot of fun. You know? And then we do wine on tap as well, mm -hmm. and that's all Colorado fruit. So the tap system, I mean, it's becoming very popular throughout the country now. It really is. Any restaurant that's doing a wine body glass program, it just makes sense for the kegs are like the sixth of a barrel torpedo kegs. Right. So there's 132 five ounce mm -hmm. balls, so 660 ounces, 5.16 gallons. The wine is good for 65 days in the keg. Mm -hmm. There's zero wastage, and obviously, stainless steel right. keg is good for 25, 30 years, you know. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for us. So, is there something you want? people out there to know about Infinite Monkey Theorem that they probably don't know yet? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, it was really like an experiment to see whether 
an urban winery could be um, embraced by the local community. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, the whole idea was, I was so annoyed by the pretense and the elitism that, that exists in the wine industry right. and how snobbish it is. And, you know, how you end up in Napa with like rolling vineyards mm -hmm. and marble tasting and floors and you end up with a case of wine you never even wanted because you were so enamored <laughs> by like the visuals. Well here, you know, you're downtown Denver, you judge the wine on its merits and not mm -hmm. its surrounding meadows, you know. Like, and um, it's been amazing to see the, the local community response. Um, you know, we, if we're bottling, we get volunteers from Facebook, they come down and they just help us bottle and of course they go out and they advocate on behalf of the mm -hmm. winery. You know? I think we've got like 5,000 Facebook fans and 2,000 of them have been to the winery. That's awesome. Which is pretty incredible yeah. hit, hit rate, I would say. Um, so yeah, really just the fact that people have really embraced the fact that we are here and we're doing something good. They love the fact that you know 95% of the fruit is, is grown locally. Um, they love the fact that the wine is actually good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like the packaging is cool. Um, but the whole, the whole product, the whole package is good. The wine's good, the package is good. You know, we donate a portion of the proceeds to the University of Colorado Cancer Center uh, in honor of my father who died of colon cancer. Uh, last year we did $10,000 donation. So, we, we, you know, we do a lot of cool things. Uh, we have like a community garden for a restaurant uh, called Old Major, mm -hmm. which is just over here, which I can show you, um, up in the Highlands. So they grow about 10% of the produce of the restaurant in that. All those raised beds are fed by the compost from the great market and stuff from the skins oh, and the stems. Okay. Yeah, so it's a nice little cycle. That's but yeah, it. I mean, check it out. You know, the website's theinfinitemonkeyfearing.com. And um, I think we do some pretty cool stuff. Right? Yeah, we do. Well, we're in an art district here. There's about 40 galleries in River North Arts mm -hmm. District. We're on 32nd and Larimer. And um, so every first Friday, we'll have um, a restaurant called Pizza at Basta come down from Boulder mm -hmm. with their mobile wood fire oven. And they'll do, throw out these near pods and star pizzas. You know, the oven gets up to a thousand degrees and cook a pizza in a minute. That sounds They're so really delicious. <laughs> and we have an oyster bar as well. Oh, so they do chucking, chucking oysters, you know. Uh, and then we get a DJ down here and everyone's outside on the patio. And three or four hundred people down here. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we try and do as many different events as we can. Like third Thursdays, we do like this summer supper and song where we have a live band in the loading dock doors uh -huh. overlooking everyone. And people come down and hang out. Yeah, the more things we can do like that, the better, because we want people to come here. Right. We don't necessarily want them to just buy our wine from here. I'd rather they were supporting of course. the restaurants and the wine stores that mm -hmm. carry the product, but obviously we offer the product for sale as well. Yes. You want to give them that experience. Yeah, for sure, you know. Um, you know, here they can come and they can sit and have a glass of wine, like, like a wine bottle. They can buy a bottle and sit down and, you know, we'll get food cut. You know, there's a big food truck yeah. scene in just like there is in Portland. And, um, we we'll get those guys down here and obviously they can go out, get some food, come back in with it, have a bottle of wine and have a pretty cheap night out to be honest. Yeah, yeah. seriously. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ben, thank for you. taking the time to explain to me a little bit about the winery and your wines and your experience here. So if you're ever in Denver, make sure you come down here. We're on 32nd and Larimer and check out this really cool wine bar. Well, I guess you also, do you call it a wine bar? You would call it. Yeah, we call it, we call it the Wine Lab. The Wine Lab. That's right. So, thanks for joining us today. Bye.